You can also post the questions through the chat uh, function of uh, the Zoom platform. Are there any questions? Yes. Miriam. Yes, thank you, Governor. Um, I was wondering if you had had a chance to update your budget deficit forecast for the year, um, which you, you gave us at the last briefing, and um, whether you've also updated your, your expectations for job losses and small business closures. Any other questions? Question from Angelo. Yes, Angelo. Um, obviously, this was an emergency meeting. Are you planning to shorten the time between meetings going forward? And what's going to be your criteria to change? Um, uh Okay, somebody says he has raised his uh, uh, electronic hand. And the question says, from May and Guardian, uh, what does the Reserve Bank say about the suggestion that it should print money uh, to finance a fiscal deficit? Okay. And then Jan Croyer. Uh, from Film 24 says um, uh, why was the cut uh, broadcast ahead of the uh, address? Thank you. Okay, um, uh, thank you very much, Miriam. Um, the MPC and the MPR are two different platforms. The MPR goes back and reviews um, what has actually taken place. We were not presenting a budget deficit forecast. All that we did at the time was that, given what has happened to the economy and what we have seen uh, since the uh, lockdown, that uh, we think that is where the deficit could come out at. Uh, as a general principle, we do not spend time um, projecting what the deficit is going to be. We, in normal times, we just take the figure that is uh, published by the Treasury and that fits in to, for us to assess what the fiscal impulse, uh, impulse is. Uh, job losses update, uh, as we have stated, is a nightmare for forecasters at the moment. And uh, anybody who comes with a number now about what the job losses would be, they are most likely going to be a thumbs up because we do not know at the end of this lockout where, when the reset button gets pressed and where, who starts first, which industry starts first, and I wouldn't hazard into trying to, uh, to, do, uh, to do that. And uh, the question of whether we would shorten uh, the meetings no, uh, we still have the meeting in uh, May. Uh, we have got our schedule uh, going forward. Why did we have uh, this meeting? Lots of things changed since the March meeting. When we had the March meeting, yes, COVID-19 was here. We didn't know that there was going to be a lockdown. Then there was the lockdown and we were busy assessing the effects of the lockdown. Whilst we were assessing the effects of the lockdown, the lockdown got extended last week, Thursday. And so we spent the weekend, the whole long weekend, the good men and women at the SAP didn't have Easter weekend. They spent the whole Easter weekend trying to figure out what this means for the economy and thus what should the, the response of the monetary authority uh, should be. So, um, 
the big change circumstances was the lockout, which also later uh, got ex uh, extended. For now, we still have our uh, schedule of uh, the MPC uh, MPC meeting. Jan Kulonye, uh, what was the cut announced uh, before the address? It's a very simple thing. If we said that the sub is holding a press conference, there would have been speculation about what we are going to do at that press conference. And what we have done is quite consistent with what other central banks during times like this have done, which is make an announcement and say, um, if you want to understand the rationale before, be, behind the policy adjustment that we have taken, you are welcome uh, to, um, uh, to join us uh, at the press conference. Why was each on Twitter and, and there was seems to have been a problem on the website. The second thing is that it normally goes on our website first before it goes into the social media. But this thing was broadcast at the same time and the website was slow picking it up. Uh, that's a technical glitch that we could always uh, do. Um, Main and Guardian, uh, what's our response to uh, the uh, printing of money to the financing of uh, uh, deficits, basically? Um, let's just go back to basics. The South African government does not have a problem financing its deficit. The South African financial markets are deep and liquid and could meet the financing requirements of the South African government. We did, however, when we saw that uh, there was a dislocation in the secondary market, decided that we would provide liquidity so that the financial market continues to function so that the South African government could continue to finance itself and all the other issuers in the South African market who use the bond market could continue to finance themselves. We also did this because the manner in which our uh, repo rate system works is that it works on a collateral basis. And the collateral that we take at the um, SAR uh, is uh, in the form of government bonds. Now, when you take collateral, you better know what the value of that collateral is. And if there is a dislocation in the market, that means it is difficult to price the collateral. And that is why the Reserve Bank got involved in the secondary market. I need to clear uh, this thing. So that is in the secondary market. Monetization of the deficit usage printing of money. The South African Reserve Bank Act does place a limit to what the South African Reserve Bank can do in the primary market. There is a formula there that sets out the limit that is based on the outstanding liabilities of the Reserve Bank beyond which we cannot participate in the primary market, which is where the government funds, uh, uh, funds itself. The idea that you are talking about of printing money, which is basically that uh, the South African Reserve Bank could just print money and um, give it over to the South African government at zero uh, interest, and then the South African government uh, can then go and uh, uh, spend uh, the money as it, uh, as it pleases. It would not take very long before there is too much money in the economy chasing too few goods. And when you have too much money chasing too few goods, you will be faced with a situation where prices begin to rise. Understand that the banknotes and coins that you have in your pocket are just but a piece of paper or a piece of metal. The only thing that gives it them value is that there is a central bank that is prepared to stand behind those notes and coins and make sure that they are able to pay roughly the same amount of goods and services 
in the future as it is buying today. Put simply, the mandate of the Reserve Bank is to contain inflation and measures like deficit financing through the printing of money are not in accordance with what the South African Reserve Bank is actually tasked, uh, tasked to do. So, put, let's just round this thing up. South Africa has got a functioning financial market. The South African government can finance itself there. The South African Reserve Bank has got a responsibility to ensure that financial markets function properly so that all other issuers can continue to use those financial markets. And thirdly, that to ensure that our uh, repo system works and that collateral is adequately priced, it is in the interest of the SAP to have a functioning uh, financial uh, financial market. Um, there are other questions posted uh, there from um, Funeco. Uh, what's the driver of high economic growth in 2021 and 2022? Uh, the risk up or the, on the downside, uh, what consideration to further? Uh, somebody had typed in uh, quickly once I was reading. Uh, Chris, this is going to be your question, my friend. Uh, Chris, can you deal with that growth question? Yeah. Uh, yes, sure. Um, <clears throat> just reading it quickly. Uh, uh, well, we didn't consider any further credit rating downgrades uh, on the growth forecast. Um, the uh, drivers of higher growth in 2021 and 2022 uh, are essentially the normal recovery in the economy. So we have uh, consumption, spending, uh, investment, and exports all normalizing to some extent, although uh, we've dampened down the recovery quite a lot uh, relative to uh, what it could be. So it's not really a V-shaped recovery. It's much more of a prolonged, uh, gradual recovery. Um, uh, are the risks to the upside or the downside? Uh, look, that's really hard to tell. I, you know, I think the level of uncertainty out there is just so high. You know, a lot really depends on what the global economy does. So uh, if we see big advanced economies coming out of uh, their own periods of lockdown relatively quickly and economic activity picking up quickly, then uh, we would have to pencil in a kind of V-shaped recovery for the globe, uh, and, and that would have a big impact on South Africa's uh, own recovery, the shape of it. Uh, but if there are repeated waves of pandemics and economies go through cycles of lockdowns over time, uh, then that recovery is going to be very, very muted indeed. Uh, and so, you know, we, alongside lots of other people, are watching very closely to see how China's uh, recovery goes. So, uh, and that recovery has been relatively, uh, relatively modest and moderate. So, um, I think our, at this stage, our expectation is that that's likely to happen throughout the global economy um, and then feed through into our own numbers. So we have a recovery, uh, and but you know a lot of that statistical bounce back that occurs when households and businesses start to come on stream. Um, we make some assumptions about the pace at which that happens, uh, but most of that uh, the, that kind of uh, gradual normalization uh, happens into the third, fourth quarter, first quarter of 2021, uh, and so. Uh, those numbers might look quite optimistic, but they're they're fairly modest, actually. Okay, um, uh, Fundi, can you deal with the, there's a question about uh, whether we are concerned about negative real interest rates? If you could uh, deal with that, and uh, Rashad, can you deal with the QPM question? And then um, there's a question from Nikano about. Uh, uh, 
liquidity in the financial markets fully that sounds like uh, it has got your name written all over it and then there's a question from fifi about uh, the imfc we will deal with that at the end of the uh, mpc questions uh, thank you all let me start with the liquidity question from lucanio and then I just might need to be reminded on who asked the question on the negative real interest rates. So on the liquidity questions, certainly we have seen, and, and that's also the feedback that we've received from market participants, that the measures that we put in place to manage liquidity are working. And we continue to monitor on a daily basis and also during the course of the day whether they are signs of, of market stress. And, and so far, we, we haven't seen much. We are continuing with our, our bond purchase program um, on, on a daily basis. So that, that also is, is, is moving along. And we would be monitoring, I guess, and if we were to see any signs of stress, we would take appropriate action as, as, as the SARB in, in terms of the measures that we have announced. We run weekly auctions, um, and our weekly repo auctions have been for a term repo of one week and three months, and, and we continue to communicate with market participants as to whether the term that we're providing is, is sufficient, and we, we continue that conversation with them on a weekly basis. Okay. Um, Lucanio, if I look at your question, you also want to know about the risk that government might struggle to finance through financial markets. When we are putting in place a liquidity management strategy as the SARP, we are not looking at the cost of financing by government, given the levels of the bond yields. We just seek to ensure that there are sufficient buyers and sellers in the government bond market so that the, the market can, uh, can function. And there are things that, of course, government itself is aware of that, that has to be done. And, and there are things that they monitor in, in the way that they run their auctions on a weekly basis as well. So we continue to liaise with them on, 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 that, on that issue. Okay, can I get a reminder as to who asked the question on the negative rates? I didn't see that. Ah, right, I see it's from Ed. Okay, so the question is, is the Saab concerned about the prospect of negative interest rates? We're not there yet, Ed. So I think that the, the primary driver for the NPC decision is about what is happening to inflation and what the inflation fundamentals look like. And we have said that, that at the moment, and if you will see the data that we will publish later on, that our assessment at the moment is we're still in the realm of positive uh, real interest rates. And one would have to see what is happening to inflation and what action that requires from us as, as a SAR. So, so far, we are still in the territory of positive in real interest rates, and we are taking the action that we think is appropriate to respond to, to inflation as, as the NPC. I think that's where I will leave my, that's where I will leave my comments for now. Uh, thank you very much. Let me just uh, say something quickly about the QPMI. I'm struggling to, re to, read, to read the chats on my uh, Zoom, but I, I'll give you a sense of what I think the question was. I mean, we, we have these pace of uh, 250 basis point zero cuts and then a 25 basis point zero cut. Essentially, what we've done is we front loaded it. Uh, we've decided on 100 basis points. And I think that the key thing now is that when we re-estimate or recalibrate the model, uh, we will then look at what the model says, given given uh, our new parameters. So for all intents and purposes, although as, is, as, as was the case in the previous meeting, is the model recommended a, uh, a pace of cuts over a, a period of time. 
uh, 75 basis points, we decided under the given the given the circumstances uh, to cut 100 basis points. Uh, we now we now in a new round with with, with new estimates, particularly uh, a massive decrease in um, in our output gap, increase in output gap and decrease uh, in our growth for 2021, and that has taken us uh, to a particular uh, to a particular path. In fact. Uh, if you extend the model, that path could also kind of move to the other direction. It could call uh, for a tighter tightening later on uh, in in the process. But I'm not sure about the specifics of of the question. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, we have several on the chat. Uh, Hilary, I don't see your question on the chat. Okay, may, may I ask them in person? Um, yes. I had uh, two. The, the one is, if you look at the the, the path, of, what you see is the path of inflation and of growth, with inflation and growth expected to pick up next year. Would those be signals for interest rates to rise again? Um, when you say you're data dependent, are you would would you would would the data suggest that um, interest rates could again have to be raised once inflation and growth start to be pick up pick, start to pick up next year? That's that's my first question, and the second question is um, um, we we know that that a credit guarantee scheme or a funding for lending scheme of some sort is being discussed by the Treasury, by the SAAB, by the banks to, to back, um, to let the banks go further to back, uh, to back companies. Um, would such a scheme have any monetary policy implications or regulatory implications? Thanks. So, Vesetra, can I jump in on the first part of that question? Yeah. I tried to answer it um, in the in the in the chat there. Um, look, the 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 real rate is meant to be a forward-looking rate. So, uh, if you take inflation four quarters ahead, the current repo rate uh, generates a negative real rate. Over time, as inflation comes back. That real rate is going to uh, is going to narrow a bit, and so it's that kind of change in the real repo rate over time that we have to watch. So uh, next year, if the real re if the normal nominal repo rate is still sitting at four point two five percent, but inflation is expected to be uh, closer to five percent or four and a half, then that's going to generate uh, a, a large real negative rate probably at a time when we're less keen on seeing that happen because the economy is well into, into recovery. So it's that, that trajectory of the real rate on a forward-looking basis that we need to, uh, we need to monitor. Um, but, you know, a lot will obviously depend on whether or not those growth and inflation projections uh, transpire. Thanks. Okay, thanks, uh, uh, Chris. Uh, you don't need the... Uh a uh, thing about uh, guarantee scheme and uh, well, the world over when we have seen this, whether they are in the US or in the UK or wherever, uh, there are treasuries behind them. So that question is best answered by the treasury than by the Reserve Bank. You did though raise a question about uh, what would the monetary policy effects of such a scheme uh, be? We don't know, we have not, there are you know, one of the things I had learned uh, over the uh, past three weeks is that there isn't a shortage of ideas coming up uh, uh, in South Africa. Some of them useful, uh, others outrightly ridiculous, some of them um, bordering on recklessness. And uh, for policymakers, the, what has to be done is to consider him to distill this thing and see what is viable proposition and what is not. And for us to assess what the monetary policy effect of any of these schemes, we must first see what the details of the scheme uh, are. We, from where we are as the central bank, I need to state this COVID-19 
has been both a supply and a demand side shock. The ability of the monetary authorities in this space is really to deal with the demand side shock. Hence, the adjustment in the policy rate. And so, what we have actually then seen is that as a central bank, we look at our entire range of tools and we would deploy our tools as appropriate in accordance with our mandate to cushion the South African economy from this shock. That's what a central bank can do. All many of these schemes which have got spending decisions, we must understand. Central bankers as technocrats do not have the ability, neither do they have the authority to make spending decisions. In our constitutional setup, spending decisions are the preserve of the publicly elected officials, publicly elected representatives of the people of South Africa. And those decisions are best made there rather than by technocrats in a central bank. Um, I think that deals with all the questions. If uh, you had posted a question and we didn't uh, respond to it, you are welcome to post it in person. Uh, before we close the conference. Okay, there aren't any other indications. Thank you very much for your uh, understanding and your participation in this uh, uh, press conference. Uh, this conference is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>